All right, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for that opening message there. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Key to Games podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we're the art and science of games. I am Josh Placer, and we have another great design topic for this week. Join me, my co-host, the developer working on the upcoming game, uh, Samurai Pig, Joshua Reyes. How are you doing this week? I am doing well, my friend. Uh, let's see here. This week has been like a bug snack week. Bugs on bugs for me. So just squashing bugs <laughs> in Unreal Engine 5. Um, other than that, busy week. Doing good. Uh, how about you? Busy week uh, for me as well. I've been writing the book and doing late night recordings and <laughs> videos as oh, yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. Unlimited, <laughs> unlimited late night recordings. <laughs> yeah, that's how you know you're an adult. When the best thing is you get to do more work. <laughs> you can that's now right. work anytime you want. Congrats, work anytime, 24-7. There Unrestricted. You go. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's been a... a always busy we we got more things to plan for the round tables we have to get things over that influential games cast as again uh, josh is still learning the joys of time zones and trying to get five different people <laughs> all on the same track here hurting car hurting cats is easier man it's so <laughs> it's yep, much pretty easier because they're, they're on the same time zone as me right if i see them there in this <laughs> but i welcome everybody in chat for our topic this week, this is going to be kind of a continuation of what we were talking about last week when it comes to too much gameplay, and that is the challenge of working on sequels. Whether you are planning one game, two game, 15 games, whatever Final Fantasy is up to these days, or Call of Duty. Like I, I was originally thinking about either doing Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed as the thumbnail, and I honestly can't remember how many games were up to in either series. But... Uh, thankfully, uh, Ubisoft took care of my thumbnail this week. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Ubisoft, for the uh, <laughs> art here. <laughs> it was perfect timing when I saw that. I couldn't believe it. Perfect timing and <laughs> that thumbnail. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when it comes to development, as we've said before, it's the basically the goal of any studio, whether you are indie to AAA, to have established franchises. You want to build your name, you want to build your studio. Some studios tend to go for very much the one-off approach, as we've seen with Supergiant Games, probably being one of the biggest in the yeah. examples of this. Hit Fox would be another one. And then we have developers who try to keep growing franchises. And this is something that I think we see predominantly from the AAA, I mean the AA space. We look at everything from Yakuza, Mario... Pony mentioned Halo. Halo. Um, what was that? I was just uh, the Shin Megami Tensai series and so on. And there is, as we all know, really good. <laughs> Pony's gonna like cough up a lung at this rate with all the examples he has. <laughs> but we have seen that there is. Uh oh, wait, was it? Oh, yeah, I'd like to fix the background noise. Uh oh. Uh, I hope it's my. I wonder if it's my fan that's doing that. My mic. Which Josh? <laughs> See, yeah, I'm not hearing anything on. Uh, do you hear anything background wise on my? I end? literally hear none. I do fix if there is any uh, background noise or fuzz. I do turn on my noise gate even more when I do the recordings. Strange, yeah. it's actually like the the cleanest one left, Josh. Yeah, so yeah, it's probably my uh, slight fan that you're hearing. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me adjust. I'll just my uh, filter. Just slightly here. I'll just twenty. Tell me if that is any better. Yeah. Again, it's too many fans, Josh. We got too many fans now. Too many subs. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that it is still eighty-one, or it's eighty degrees now in September. It's that yeah. lovely uh, October summer heat I'm going to have again. <laughs> and hello, uh, Rat's Tail as well. Welcome, Rat's Tail. But when we talk about the use of sequels that it is good money there is a yeah. lot of income there's a lot of strategy in terms of building franchises as sequels for one it gets rid of some of the guesswork in terms of what you're going to be doing as well as what the fan base is going to be when you are on game number three five seven whatever 
it's very easy to expect, well, if 3 million people or 3 million copies were sold in game number 2, we can probably expect, you know, around that or even more for the next game. Uh, Dark Souls and all these Souls likes from From Software is another really good example. It provides a sense of security. Again, you know people like this gameplay. They bought the last five games. So it's not like, oh, everyone's now going to get sick, to t sick and tired of Souls Lake design when we got to Elden Ring. Right. But the problem, as we've said, is that sequels tend to run their course. And we've seen this again with games like Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, Madden, Halo, and so on, that at some point, it just feels like, you know, we're not only just, like, beating a dead horse, we're, like, nuking it from yeah. outer space with an orbital laser. Yeah. I think, I think in that, like, the biggest problem that people feel is, like, when they can tell, like, the, like it, it, the IP's been beaten to death, the orbital laser's burnt it, it's crisp, and it's now we're just trying to extract cash, like, the cash grab thing. Uh, when you can tell that that's mm -hmm. like really the main purpose, like the board members are like, we need another one of these. The devs, you know, there's a lot of things that go that need to happen for like a, a good like sequel, right? You got to have enough meat in the bones in the game, right? Reason, right? That there has to be a reason for it to keep going. Um, but like the teams and the devs, right? Like, did they really want to do it? Were they forced into uh, creating another one? And that can like create some weird issues, right? You know? Mm hmm And like you just said, you can tell when I think the developers are interested in working on a sequel. And this, I think, is another very big point, as we're going to talk about over our episode this week, is that kind of line of when is a sequel just a complete departure from the previous game, and when is it just, again, a copy-paste affair? And we've seen a lot of this from the AAA space, where either, you know, Uncharted 1 is a whole lot like Uncharted 2, which is also a whole lot like Uncharted 3. Yeah. Or we get sequels that are just so raggedy different, it feels like they're just attaching the name for the IP. Or we do have positive examples, like, again, like, the original Assassin's Creed to Assassin's Creed 2... That was a fantastic leap. Like Assassin's sure. Creed 2 is one of my it's probably my favorite of the Assassin's Creed, and it's probably one of the most well received of the franchise. It, and it's like um there are some games, right, that you can tell they needed like more funding or more time to marinate, and you could tell they really needed that sequel, and the sequel is like really mm -hmm. the peak of it, right? So that happens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the first one you can tell is just a little missing something. They they were trying to find their footing. Second one, the code base is good. The team stayed there. They didn't have high turnover rate or something, and it came out good, right? Um, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, and as you just said, like, another advantage of working on sequels is that it gives you that sense that the game is, like, the foundation of the game is done. That yeah. you're not starting back at zero. And as I'm sure every indie developer, I mean, developer watching this knows that once you've gotten, like, the establishment done, you can then say, okay, what can we do from here? Yeah. And with Assassin's Creed 2 as another example, they pretty much improved, I think, every aspect of the first game in that second one. And, again, as we've said before, that when we look at franchises that blow up, like Final Fantasy, Mario, and so on, you can't just go from Final Fantasy 1 to Final Fantasy 15, or Super Mario Brawlers to Super Mario Odyssey. It takes, one, the confidence that you know your design is working, and two, it takes having that foundation. We know what our progression is going to be in a Mario. We know the basic tech that's going to be featured. Where can we go from there? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Instead, instead of focusing, I mean, because every game developer's favorite thing is to start over from scratch, right? Have all your code deleted and just start from nothing. That's our favorite thing to do. So, so yeah. When you <laughs> go ahead, John. I was gonna say that should be the new feature in Yu-Gi-Oh! on Unreal. You know, the second you hit ship your game, would you like to delete all code? Yes or no? You pr prestige your game. There you go. Game development, new game plus. There. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. 
<laughs> I'm gonna work on that plugin. But yeah, it's like when you have that when you have that base and you have lore and you have characters and you have so much stuff that you can work with, it's really an amazing thing like to do, right? And like we would all like I'm there's so many devs that would be salivating to like take certain IPs because they're so well established and we could do stuff with it and we know we could take another look on it. I think the problem really happens is when it's like the same game over again and there was no really reason to do it. Like it should have been DLC, should have been I don't know, something else, Josh, but not another entire game, you know? Yeah, and that is definitely one of the major points when we talk about uh that the downsides of sequels, especially when it comes to the independent space, that there are developers who have worked on their own franchises for years. They have, you know, four, five, six different games in them. And then when you go to play them, it's almost like word for word the exact same game. Maybe, you know, the pixel art is a little bit sharper. Maybe instead of a red health bar, it's a green health bar. It still is just the same game. And that is, and we'll talk about later in this cast about when you go too far outside of the uh, box there. But for a lot of developers, when you're trying to, and this is, again, like from our chat last week, it's why I think a lot of indie devs tend to overstuff their main game. They don't want to turn this into a 20-game franchise. They want to make their dream game, and then when that's done, you know, never look at this again. It is complete. You know, it's off to the pasture with it. Never, I never want to look at this character I made ever again. Yeah, it totally happened. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've interviewed plenty of devs, and like toward the end of the cycle, like they're just sick of the game. They've been working on it, thinking about it every day, nightmaring about it. Um, just everything so yeah like a a lot of times they want to put all of their eggs in the basket but we usually know what happens when you put all the eggs in the basket right well probably a couple of them get cracked or i don't know something not good happens there's a reason for the saying (laughs) but uh but yeah definitely Mm -hmm. and to pony's comment and to lucas yeah if it's not broken don't fix it but Again, people don't want to just play the same thing from, you know, 10 different games of the same developer. And again, it's that issue we talk about when it comes to overstuffing, that, you know, if this game has 500 levels, it's going to be, you know, four times or five times better than a game that has 100 levels. And converse, or the same way, you know, with this franchise, you know, we're up to 15 games, you know, we have all this prestige. I mean, how many times have we seen trailers and developers talk about, you know, this is from the makers of uh, Jump, Jumping Man 1 and Jumping Man 2 and Jumping Man 3, Jump Again. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, so you really like Jumping, jumping Man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. I like I like um, um, Pony's uh, comment about every time you take a hit, you lose a file on your hard drive. That's <laughs> real Miyazaki. You don't have to do that, Josh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and when you're trying to come up with stuff for a sequel, this is something that I think we see, I think, more experienced developers tend yeah. to do better at this. Yeah. That there's always room, I feel, to improve your game. There's always something you could do maybe a little bit better, a little bit more refined. Or, let's say you are going to t- try something different. You know, you know, your game inside and out, you know, forward and back. Why don't we do something a little bit weirder for our next game? And from developers who tend to focus on, like, different kinds of gameplay, we've seen, again, some very experimental stuff from indie devs. And a lot of that um, experimental stuff is not going to really, I think, work when it comes to sequels. Like, um, Cruelty Squad, I think, is a really good example. Yeah. Like, I think there's only going to be one Cruelty Squad, and I don't think you can really do... You can't really go beyond with a game like that. Yeah, there's... I mean, there's a ton of games, like, you just really can't go any further. It's, like, mm-hmm. one and done, and, like, you keep just 
it's trying to expand on it and there's really not much else you can do to it right you can add on maybe tack on little costumes and things in this and that nature but it's not an entire game it's just like that one series and sometimes that's usually the best like i don't know i mm -hmm. would argue that most of the time sequels usually just don't don't usually work out. I mean, of course, there's the big boys, Final Fantasy, Elder mm -hmm. Scrolls, um, you know, all, all, you know, Assassin's Creed, um, you know, that that can do do that. But with the indie guys, you need like a dedicated writing team that are thinking ahead. Uh, and of course, when you're an indie team, you don't even know right if you're what's going to happen like most of the times the any teams getting interviewed we had no idea no one anyone was going to like this game and and that's the way it is and then they're stuck right with the pressure rock in the hard place what do you do do i make a sequel we didn't even want to make one I have no idea what to do and then they make one and it's horrible <laughs> and like that right there you just described what happened with among us among us that... yeah literally thinking of that the whole time yeah and again for like for people who miss that story that when the game blew up, and I think it was like 2020, they were already working on a sequel to try and fix a lot of the issues and complaints in the first game. So when it blew up, it completely took them unaware, and then they tried to roll all the things that they wanted to fix in the sequel in back into the base game and what they, their pre-existing engine. And it set them back a lot of time. I think they're still trying yeah. to add everything in there. Yeah. And as we've said, when it comes to live service games, you're only as good as your last bit of your last update. Yeah. And if, you know, people get tired of your game, if they don't want to, if they don't want to wait six months for you to release a new map or fix an issue, they're not coming back. And, and like and then what you're talking about like the retro that's one of the most difficult things like if you're trying if it wasn't originally planned on the game and you're like yeah we plan for it or, and you're trying to retrofit it back into your code i mean that's just like bugs on bugs on bugs on bugs on bugs like it is like that's probably one of the more difficult things to do is like going backwards trying to put things that weren't designed in your code where more likely like you'd have to just redesign it either way you're mm -hmm. losing tons of time yeah. right and to Lucas's comment, yeah, once you find your expertise, you can definitely focus on that. But again, the problem that we're talking about is that there is no growth. And I've played games, and this is one of the things that we talked about last week and something that I've harped on a lot. If people find issues in game number one, those issues should be gone for game number two, and they definitely. damn better well not be there when we get to game number three. Right, I, I love it when it when it like for some reason it, it's gone in two and then they bring it back in three because they thought you loved it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, this, I, 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 go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. I'd have to think of this thought, the like what stat it is or something, but it's common in games like for them to like. Okay, I know you hated this in the first one, so it's gone now, but it's back again, and mm -hmm. I, it happens more often than not. Yep, and again, this is where having an understanding of game design and game mechanics really is important. Is that you need to understand what people like and what they don't like. And you also should be able to look at your game objectively and say, okay, I could have done this better. Or let's say, you know, this section right here, I can see, you know, 15% of my player base stopped playing. We went from like 80% to 65%. Maybe something is wrong there. Yeah. What you don't want to do, again, is say, you know what? 20% of my player base actually beat my game. Let's only design the game around that 20% of the audience. Because then we get into the echo chamber effect. Yeah. And that's when it becomes very hard to grow. Because again, like when we talk about franchises and sequels, the goal, as we've said, is that you want to keep Bang. your fan base happy, and you also... Grow want to convert new people yeah because you're going to have if you do your job right more people checking things out you know hey you know this franchise is up to game number six and all my yeah, friends what's can't the, what's shut this up about, about it. it yeah yeah definitely you get clout you get all kind of stuff yeah that comes along with it i mean like mm -hmm. you will have people that don't even know about they hear about final fantasy like why is there 16 games oh my gosh i gotta check it out like you know just because it's lasted so long you know? Yeah, and the worst thing is that this new person checks your game and goes, 
oh my god, what the heck is this gameplay? It's, you know, why, is, why are there no volume sliders? Why can't I move my character right? Uninstall, and they're never going to look at you again, and you just wasted that potential opportunity. For sure, Josh, for sure. And to Chris's comment, there's only a skill knowing what you should have, yep, and that is something that Chris Park has talked about quite a lot when it comes to Arkin. We've, again, Chris and I have, like, easily three to four hour long conversations, and it is a very hard skill to pick up, because, again, you never know what is going to resonate with people. Like we've said, like, that weird cooking mini game where you have to fish and, you know, you fry up your fish, that could turn into its own franchise if everyone falls in love with it. Dude, like Gwent, right? I mean, like triple any, like triad, you, triple triad. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's like some blitzball could have probably been a cool thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I like, mean, uh, how many game jams? You know, all those crazy ideas that you never knew people would really find interesting, and all of a sudden, this crazy idea takes home you know top prize at game jam. Yep. Yeah, that's. I mean, as, as I always say, you know, depending on on your experience or what you're doing, game jams are really good uh, to like, you know, try something experimental, uh, meet some new people. Of course, it just depends where you're at in your career, but really nice, cool place to do stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Blitzball standalone would be cool. People <laughs> would like that. Let's see. Uh, Lucas said, "What you guys think is the main reason AAA game developers don't listen to real feedback?" Yeah, I mean, that is a very tough thing. Again, when it comes to studying a game's success, we've said this before, and I think indie developers are also victim to this, that a lot of developers have trouble, I think, taking an objective look at their game. And again, when we say looking at the design, this doesn't mean looking at your sales numbers. Yes, a game, your, you know, game number one can sell, let's say, 200,000 copies. That doesn't mean that every one of those 200,000 copies, the person left your game happy. Again, there are a lot of people who, when they don't like a game, they're going to refund it, they will never say a word about it, and you will never hear from them. And like we said, I, the, go ahead. I've, liter I've literally bought, like, $60 games, mm -hmm. any game, and like never even, I didn't like it, and I didn't leave a review or nothing, like, so there was no feedback for me, I didn't like the game at all, and I was like, I'm not gonna like leave a review or whatever, I'm a developer, I can't be doing bad, <laughs> so like, there's lots of times where I've played so many games, and there's no feedback for me, right, so it's like. Yep, and there are, I think, a lot of developers out there who only view, you know, copies sold, as yeah. the sole metric of a game's quality. And yeah. I've seen indie developers who they will try and, you know, say, oh, you know, this person's complaining, but, you know, me and my 300,000 copies sold, you know, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over that. And then I look at the game and it goes, you know, like 100%, 18% in about 30 minutes of play. So again, a lot of people I feel won't refund a game. Other, unless it's, like, completely erroneous, Rearing. you know, like, yeah. turn game on, Windows file gets deleted, <laughs> that kind of bad thing. But, like we've said, there are a lot of any developers, and again, but part of the issue of sequels is that they'll think that, well, if game number one sold 300,000 copies, well, surely I can make a sequel that will sell 500,000 copies, or 750,000 copies. But again, if out of those 200,000, let's say only 60,000 actually finished your game, that means that your audience is actually at about 60,000 copies or 60,000 uh, products sold. And this can come back to bite developers. We've seen this with studios like, um, what was it, uh, Hand of Fate who their games are critically well-received, and they crash after their second game. Now, like, they're actually working on a new game now, like some of the uh, former people, so I'm really happy about that. <laughs> the boy band quality argument. But again, just because a lot of people bought your first game, that doesn't mean they're sticking around for game number two or game number eight 
or whatever else you have planned. My favorite one is like like going in the AAA space. The Last of Us. I didn't play the second one. Like The Last of Us was my one of my favorite games. Like, and I didn't play the second one. And and it's just in my and I, in my head, I was like the first one was perfect. I don't understand what you could do, or like I don't even know where you could go with the story that would satisfy me. Right. So that you know sometimes that happens. Um, but like yeah, I mean like huge games even like fall victim to it. You know. Just like us, just like the indie games. Yep, and yeah. For a lot, going back to a point you said a few minutes ago about how you never know what game's going to blow up, this is also some of the challenge when it comes to carrying on stories. Yeah. For studios, they don't know if, you know, the story they wrote for a, let's say, a six game franchise is going to die after game number two or even die after game number one. Yeah. And it always is that issue, like, you know, oh, you defeat the big band in game number one. Well, just kidding, there's a bigger band in game number two. <laughs> oh, you killed him? No, you didn't. He was faking it. Now, game number three. Right, right. And it, it, it's one of the nightmares of writing the story of some of these franchises. Again, uh, from Solver has it easy. They just say, well, it all happened 800,000 years ago. Just go kill this other guy, and then we'll reset the cycle for the next game. Yeah, definitely. That's the easy way to do it. <laughs> but yeah, man, sales sales necessarily sales don't mean um, you know Christmas is sales doesn't mean you know it's like Madden. I'm sure Madden sells like crazy, but what's the quality of that game like mm -hmm. by now? It's I mean <laughs> it's probably worse than it's ever been. I don't know. I just feel like it it really hasn't improved, and and it's just like. Yeah, the game games can get a ton of sales. You know, just some people have bad taste, or they're just it's a comfort food game for them. You know what I mean? Like they're always gonna buy the Call of Duty. That's the only one they mm -hmm. play, or the Madden is the only one they play. It's not really a significant indicator of a quality of a game. Uh, always. Yeah. And I do think like series like Silent Hill and Resident Evil have gone away with the fact that they oftentimes will change protagonists. They'll change you yeah. know locations. Uh, the yeah story. And I think like a universe, right? Like yeah. just kind of you know, like an overall kind of universe and then changing who's in it and around it. And that can really keep things going because if you're the same protagonist over and over again, I mean, it really, mm -hmm. it, you know, it can get kind of boring. Like I was kind of amazed that they could stretch like God of War, like uh, Kratos' story out so long when he's just like, oh, I'm angry. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, what can you do? Can you do that? So I was a bit surprised they did that. Good gameplay, right? It, was, it had mm -hmm. good core gameplay loops. So that's why. Um, but yeah. yeah I mean they've stretched out uh, Kazuma Kiryu's story for what like six Yakuza games until yeah. they <laughs> <laughs> but Insane. yeah but again like I think Yakuza games are a very uh, a rare exception to that rule. yeah <laughs> yeah they're really uh, yeah very rare exception very neat very niche niche yeah. lots of cool stuff in that game and again, you also run the risk, if you don't do a good enough job of your sequels, of kind of soling up the franchise as a whole. Um, yeah. With Dead Space, you know, Isaac went from, you know, voiceless silent protagonist in the first game, to like, he didn't just stop talking in the second game, to then he's like, angry, you know, first person shooter guy in the third game. And his Doom guy in the third game? <laughs> there you go. And uh, the uh, Tomb Raider reboots. That, you know, mm -hmm. the game number one, she's a novice. Game number yeah. two, she's still a novice. Game number three, she's still trying to figure out if she wants to be a Tomb Raider. <laughs> yeah. Those were good games, though. Those were good games, but <laughs> hopefully she figures it out if she wants to raid some tombs or not. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I... when it, I would say, like, one franchise that I think has done really well with, like, keeping it going would be Hitman. Yeah. Like, hit, like, Iowa Interactive, and this is something that we've said before, like, you can tell when a studio knows what they're doing. Like, they have this idea, they know that we know what people want out of our games. Let's just keep nailing that nail in. We're just going to keep hammering that nail in. We know what works. We're not going to turn, you know, Agent 47 into some, you know, wise-cracking, you know mile a minute jokester we're not going to yeah. throw in you know the hardcore survival horror he's a guy that kills people in ex exceedingly more elaborate and over-the-top ways 
let's roll with that. Right, and if you've watched the like the developer intro, they know like one hundred percent what the game's about, and they're like, "We basically want to give you this environment, and you can you can play around with it. Here's the rules. The rules are like this, and everything makes sense. And then and then instead, it becomes like really a level uh, elaborate uh, level design and uh, or amazing level design and like an emergent gameplay, right? And it's just this really great sandbox. Um, I, I didn't think that that game would have legs and somehow they just really kept, kept going at it and were kept refining it and refining it, you know? And it turned into a games of a service title with yeah, the game of a service the That's... trilogy and it works really well. Again, I still owe people I need to play the Hitman trilogy at some point. And yeah, it is a fascinating design. And again, it's another example of one that you couldn't start at the last trilogy in terms of gameplay loops figure yeah, out it takes never. a lot of time it is so deep yeah it is so deep like i mean if you if you look like like if you follow them and you like see the mechanics from like i don't know one to two to it is really they're really adding on and everything but everything fits and when we were talking about like uh in the, in the previous podcast about adding too many mechanics and all of the mechanics work really well and everything makes sense you know what i mean and mm -hmm. uh just an excellent example of that for um, sure pokemon games yeah like i've played all the hitman games i played one two i'm pretty sure i played blood money i played the one app absolution and then i tried a little bit of hitman uh one in the trilogy but I still need to really go back and play that. To and, do it for your, like, 10k... Well, I owe for the 5k, actually, because <laughs> I never had a chance to... Because I was still on my old computer there and just couldn't handle it. <laughs> yeah. And yet, yeah, and to Chris's comment, that's the other challenge of... That's another major point about sequels, and why we see some developers who will go too far, is that there's that expectation that if game number one is here... Game number two has to be here, three, four, five, six, and we just keep going. And some franchise or some designs, you can't necessarily do that without completely upending or overhauling every single system in your title. Definitely, yeah. Um, I mean, the I, I just think the pressure of, of a follow-up sometimes, I, I think kind of covered it, is like... I mean, it's it, it, you have nowhere to go but down, right? I mean, and that's the that's the, kind of the hard part. It are are probably one of the worst parts is like is yeah, mm -hmm. you can go up for sure, it, it, but it's probably going to be just you know a little bit, or it could be you know, but most likely is going to go down unless you have the team is there, you have uh, the, the the dev, the meat for the game and uh, um all that stuff but otherwise yeah man it i think the pressure is really hard on a team uh to follow up on that mm -hmm. uh i want to go back to uh, mr gaming chat's comment about five nights at freddy's sure yeah yeah, yeah that i think is a very unusual like example of this like there are so many games in yeah. there and I... they've all featured some unusual like wrinkle to the gameplay like, i know the second one and you could like you had to put on like a mask the third game had like the uh you had to like s use like sounds to confuse characters like they've done a i think a good job of trying something different with each game but it also again runs to that problem of it it's still like that same kind of loop like again like if it's not I think the thing with uh, Finance of Freddy's at this point, it's not winning new fans. Like, if you hated Finance yeah. of Freddy's 1, 2, yeah. 3, whatever, the issues I think you have in that franchise aren't going to be erased. Like, yeah. they're not going to turn Finance of Freddy's again into a full and first person shooter or, you know, give you full motion. Well, actually, no, that's a lie. They did that in the uh, latest one, the one that was like another spin-off where you can actually walk around in full environments. Yeah, full in-sim, turn it into an in-sim. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but yeah, like that is a good example, again, of how you want to approach sequels if you're a smaller developer. Look at ways of experimenting. But you also want to make sure that things fit. 
And again, like this is to going back to when I talked with Chris Park about his games, and we've said this before about what your core gameplay loop is. If this is your core gameplay loop, every single system needs to adhere to it. If you want to try something different or weird or something that doesn't feel like it's necessarily required, that's good stuff to save for an expansion, DLC, or even a sequel. But again, so much of your first game, and I'm sure this is something that you will probably agree with, is that test bed. It is that idea that I want to make sure people like this. And it is why I think we've seen this kind of shift from any developers over the past decade. Going from, I'm going to work on this 10-year magnum opus to, this is my crazy idea. It's, you know, maybe a two to three year project. I just want to make sure people like this. You know, I don't want to spend 10 years of my life on something that, you know, we learn at the end. Well, maybe people don't like this idea. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think you mentioned it earlier where some devs were doing like uh, prologues, right? And uh, just, you know, kind of test the water. Like, like not even, in, I guess it's not really like a demo or whatever, but just testing the waters with like a prologue to your game and see how it goes. And if the prologue doesn't really stick, if it doesn't work, well, then maybe you should move on and do something else. But I think that's a good way to test the waters, mm -hmm. you know, definitely, right? Yep. And again, it gives you that idea. I won't spend t <laughs> You may be a little late for that one, Pony. Yeah, I think you already did, Pony. And yeah, you don't want to be, again, you don't want to be going down the wrong road with your game. And a lot of that, again, when we look at going from sequel to sequel, we can see that there's a difference between trying to find that spark versus we know what people like, let's keep pushing it. And I guess here's an interesting point that I want to ask everyone about this. Developers like um, Soldak Entertainment and Spireweb Software, that... Both studios have really kind of established their own very specific niches, but I don't see that evolution of gameplay. Again, if you've played a Jeff Vogue title, if you've played one, you've probably played them all. They do feature, again, very subtle differences, but like we've said, it's not a case of if something irked you in the first game, it's going to be fixed by game number two. It's probably still in game number 15, 20, yeah. how many they're up to. And I guess my the question I want to ask everyone is, do you think there is room for growth in those games? Like, do you think there is room to maneuver? Because there's always that, again, that risk of when do we go too far? Yeah, well, like, for those ones specifically... Uh I would have to say you probably have to stick pretty cl pretty close to like the way everything is built. Like you said, like you play one game, you play the next, because I think it's kind of like the expectations that the player has. And that's just like a certain type of game. But that is that again, that's probably an exception to the rule there mm -hmm. um, on, on most games. You know, most games cannot pull off that same thing. If you, they got a pain point, it's going to have to be taken on by the second one. Uh, um, mm. you know, and, and then you can't bring it back to the third one, you know, yeah. leave it out for them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe surprise people within the fifth game. Right. <laughs> it's important to surprise it. Like, <laughs> but you can turn it off in the menu if you want. <laughs> There's a new definition of surprise mechanics. You bring back something <laughs> everyone hated in the second game, you just put it back in at some random entry later on. <laughs> That's genius. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, get I guess the question the is, question. Um, do you think that like franchises that really don't see that movement, that it is very much, you know, game number one, game number two, game number three, do you think that it's better, like, do you think they could try and move in a different direction? Like, do you think there is some area that they can try to change things? without upsetting their fan base at this point i mean i mean that's kind of a difficult question yeah. and all but i mean um i would i mean i i'd say yeah definitely and and just to be really careful and like during your play testing i think would be the most important thing so like mm -hmm. um if you have you know you're gonna definitely have like 
uh, your player base and like and so we, when you're like reaching out maybe for an alpha or a beta, see maybe like what changes work in that regard. And I think that that would be a way that you could push it forward. Um, you know, but uh, it's a, that's a hard call. And I guess to put this another way, if we look at Civilization, the Civilization franchise has what they've done to try and, you know, be different is that they've always hired or they've always put somebody different as the lead designer on a city. Yeah. You know, they've gone from John Schaefer, Soren Johnson. I honestly checked out after five. I don't know who did six, but I'm sure whoever's working, if they do a seventh, they'll do that as well. And what we see in this respect, again, is that it's I, like, yep, go ahead. I, I, and I think that every time just that, that, that whoever was working under, they were working like under the previous one. So the next one would take over. So they were always really close in the development. Go ahead. Sorry. And what I was going to say was that you'll see like very subtle and sometimes not so subtle changes yeah. going from Civ 4 to 5, 5 to 6. And I feel like it's definitely, I think, a double-edged sword for them. Because there's that issue of, you know, let's say everyone really likes something in 5. Well, there's no guarantee that's going to be in 6. I know there's the whole, one of the major, like, tenets of people who've been, like, trying to get into Civ or that challenge of Civ's design is, you know, the infinite city. Or, you know, the one, you know, I'm just going to put all my infantry or all my armies in that one cluster and have this, like, death ball go around the map turn by turn yeah definitely definitely yeah and like like civilization uh you know that's one of those games like yeah like one two i mean it really hasn't changed too much added a little bit here and there uh but yeah like i think uh, what was that i mean i think the last one i played was like civ revolution not to out myself but that was <laughs> Um, uh, don't forget, Poe, and then there are sequels that just add numbers into the title itself, like Thief yeah. or three, four, or whatever one that they just threw a number in there. Uh, yeah. And I think with Civilization, even with XCOM, that they did a really good job of growing. And I guess here's another question for everyone watching and for Josh as well. Do you think a sequel should invalidate the previous entry? Because we've seen, uh, you know, franchises like Call of Duty, Madden. Like, when we get to, like, annual or mm -hmm. almost annual franchises, it feels like, okay, you, you know, game number two comes out, we only need to play game number one. Then game number three comes out, we throw out game number two, and that cycle repeats. Yeah, no, I'd have to say no. I think mm -hmm. that it should it should complement it. And the only reason is like, you know, if it was like a seasonal, right? Like a seasonal game or something like that, that it should replace it. But I think it should totally be a complement and stack onto it, fix the pain points. Uh, whatever wasn't working in the first one should be updated, cleaned up, polish it. Um, but invalidating, I feel like that's kind of like, even, even I felt that before in certain games and I felt like a slight, like I remember like, whoa, you totally just ruined the one I liked. And now it's mm -hmm. only this one. And I think it's kind of prevalent, like in multiplayer, uh, you know, like multiplayer games or esport games and stuff like that. It's like, uh, Tekken seven, uh, for, or Tekken, for example, like if you released a Tekken eight, I would think that it would be more likely to like you just to just expand it with characters or do something like that instead of like making an entirely new game although on one side note i think tekken has had the same director the entire time so the game has felt the same through the entire way i think they've had the same director mm -hmm. uh the entire time and i think what you just brought there in terms of esports and competitive play is a very interesting asset when we come to all about with sequels because there is that push in terms of, okay, people have played, you know, Street Fighter 4 to death. What do we do in Street Fighter 5? Well, now Street Fighter 5 is done, what do we do in 6? And mm -hmm. we've seen this kind of, I think the Street Fighter games and just fighting games in general. Yeah. Had that yeah. very unusual challenge of, yeah. on one hand, we want to grow the franchise. On the other hand, we have to keep the esports level competitive players happy. And then on a third hand, we have to try and bring in new people 
to this yeah. franchise. Yeah, because I mean, like right now, I, I did actually watch a little bit of Evo because I saw you were competing in it, Josh, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> so I had to watch. <laughs> and, how, uh, how did I so do? I watch- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I was watching it, and I was and I was thinking to myself. I mean, I can't imagine if they change. It's like changing up the whole everything, and then like all of a sudden, here's eight, and you just totally can blow up and destroy. Because I think it happened before. Like for for every game, every fighting game, the certain one is bad, and then that one's not even in the esports anymore. They don't talk about it anymore. It's like we don't talk about Street Fighter now. And it's uh, like, what was that? A Street Fighter Cross Tekken. I think Cross that Tekken. one has you know disappeared and faded yeah. away. It's burned. They burned all source code for it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I mean, with Street Fighter Six, like the a lot of the buzz that I'm hearing from both new and old fans is that they are mixing things up. That they're going to be having a greater focus on like parrying and counters. There's supposedly going to be an actual like story in this one beyond just a uh, nameless or just very basic cutscenes. I wonder if a lot of that came from what uh, Mortal Kombat did. When they really blew up their story-based content. And again, like, Mortal Kombat, my goodness. Like, how many redesigns have they done in that franchise? Yeah, a ton, a ton, a ton. And, like, and I remember, yeah, once they really got into the story, and then I noticed all of a sudden people were loving the wild story of it and, and just really digging it. And it's like, it's a fighting game. I didn't even know there'd be a story here, but they love the story. So it's kind of interesting. You know, put a put a, a story in your fighting game. People love it. <laughs> and then they just throw RoboCop in and uh, Rambo. <laughs> and now they're canon in uh, Mortal Kombat. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And again, like when we talk about sequels to when we talk about like moving away from competitive games, when we see sequels who, <laughs> yeah, Pony, I, we should, everyone can beat me up. I still need to play Killer Instinct too. That's still on the list to get to. I'll download it. I'll download it. We'll, we'll do a fighting night. We want to do Tekken and do Killer Instinct. I'm down. I'll be there. Oh Drink my, my God. Coffee. That's a lot of gigabytes between those two <laughs> games. <laughs> The solid state uh, drive uh, tournament right there. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I think so, uh, Chris. I know four, I think four, five, and maybe six had weapons. Again, like, there's, it's hard to remember with all those games. Beat me up. Yes. But when we see sequels from developers that are trying to mix things up, again, like, as we've been talking about over this chat, there is that risk of going too far outside yes, the box. Yes, too far. And, no and, shading. Yeah. <laughs> Ultra realistic to show shading. Yeah. Uh, again, like example that I brought up is Trine. That the Trine games, the first two yeah. games were 2D puzzle platforming. Trine Third was game, so good. Yeah. It was so good. And then Trine 3, they went full 3D and nearly bankrupt the entire company. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and this is something that we've said before about that kind of risk, you know, we talk about FOMO when it comes to consumers of fear of missing out, but then there is that other, like, fear of, like, doubling down, that, you know, we gotta keep making this bigger, we can't just stick with our laurels. And again, like, this is that issue when you run to, with games where, when they're trying to chase after something new, they remove what made the previous games work. And yeah. that is, again, like the nightmare from a lot of developers and why so many indie, deve- uh, indie devs will just kind of s- stick to that same beat. They don't, they don't know why people liked game A, so we're just going to keep making it over and over again because if we change that one thing, maybe people really like the fact our character wears green slippers all the time mm-hmm. and we switch it to, you know, red sneakers, you know, the franchise is dead exactly yeah and and uh because it was like you know and like trying i think was like okay well the first one sold for example a hundred thousand copies trying to is gonna sell five hundred thousand copies and then if we make it 3d of two billion copies or something and that's clearly what they were thinking but really like i mean what was the basic of trying it was like really cool puzzle multiplayer thing and then like when you turn it to 3d i didn't even play it i just saw it did you play it um, no yeah i mean so i don't know but yeah i mean you completely flip it and and anything that what the game really stood for 
didn't really exist and also probably you couldn't keep going with that anymore like i think that the the team was really smart right to do if you could make trying your good dev team mm-hmm. and i think that they could have probably done something else you know and probably would have been better off instead of like continuing to try and and like um beat the milk milk the cow milk the well mm-hmm. let the barn out of the, the yeah. horse <laughs> And yeah, like, it's that problem of, well, do we try to work on a new IP, or do we work on the one that we already know people like, we know how many sales we have, we know the review scores are going to get. And again, it's that risk of, well, if you do something completely new, and again, this has been a studio killer. You know, Mm -hmm. all your first, you know, the last five games have been all first-person shooters, now we're going to make a real-time strategy game, or now we're going to make a three-platformer. And one, those genres don't necessarily have comparative skills in terms of design. Two, you risk angering your entire fan base. Yeah. And three, you probably just destroy all the income you've made over all those games on something that didn't that, work. Right, right. I mean, yeah, and like one of the things you mentioned there is like, <laughs> destroying all the income and one of the reason is 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 if you're constantly switching your team up to different disciplines from platformer to th- to three d shooter like multiplayer three d shooter or something those are com- completely mm-hmm. different things like different wildly things if you if I just threw <laughs> you in a in a in a platformer dev discord and then I threw you in a like three shooter multiplayer FPS Discord. <laughs> you would not like be able to like you if you knew the basis of game, but it's completely different, right? So yeah, they don't transfer over, and even like how you code and how you develop and all that stuff, not everything transfers over to it. Like there's just like basics like <laughs> coding stuff and things like that 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 are there. But the whole gameplay design, the mechanics, what players like about it, all that, all completely different. And so to, like, just completely do it, 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 it is totally, you know, it is a risk, too, you know? There's no uh, plug-in in Unreal to just instantly swap your game to, you know, you hit a toggle, it becomes a racing, now it becomes a fishing right. game, now it becomes a right. first-person shooter. Well, right now it's just multiplayer, right, mm-hmm. multiplayer, and then the D-Make, and then, uh, what was it? Fishing. Yeah, that's just... Fishing. That's it yeah. right now. But but hopefully soon we'll have that I'm yeah. working on it. And yeah, th- that that is one of the major risks of thinking, well, you know, I'm a successful game developer, I made platformers. Surely I can take two first person shooters immediately. Or, you know, if our last game was a platformer, let's throw in a uh, racing, a hardcore racing sim, because those two things work really well. And you know, that goes into a whole lot of topics. Oh, yeah, exactly, Pony. You gotta have a deck builder roguelike. Yeah, <laughs> put in two. But that goes definitely into more of the idea of analyzing design and being able to understand what works and what doesn't. And I'm sure that is a topic we'll be talking about endlessly in a future endlessly episodes. And endlessly, endlessly, and endlessly. Yeah. And, um, yeah, man. I mean, just. Just for for sequels, you know, hey, they can be a studio killer. Like if you're any dev and you're thinking about it, you know, just be sure, be ready. If you have a plan, you know, does your game have enough meat for it? It does. It does. It make sense to continue it. Uh, would it make more sense to maybe not really diverge on like genres, but just to expand, you know, a little bit differently? Like you could even mm-hmm. stay in the same universe, right? For example, like we were talking about Silent Hill, changing protagonists, changing things like that. Because mm-hmm. like I tell you, like we were talking about Dead Space. Maybe if they changed the character and like did it to somebody else, that might have been really neat. See it from another <laughs> side of the story. I was a scientist instead, or something. Uh, the other way, he was a scientist to another scientist or something else <laughs> and then just seeing a different view might have been totally and you could have done the same game just from a different view instead of him turning into kratos doom guy you know mm-hmm. so but as you're talking about having a different protagonist don't forget when with Metal Gear solid 2 and when they uh, gave us all uh riding <laughs> yeah, but then brian yeah, blew up right. with revengeance so that's right and that's right i do think like this this could be a little bit off topic but there is definitely, I think, room for certain franchises to do spin-offs or side story style yeah, games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shimagami Tensai is a really good example of this. 
that each one of the Shin Megami Tensai games, you have the main branch games, you have the Persona games, yes. you have dungeon crawlers, you have their hack and slash, like, there's, oh my goodness, I think there's like six or seven different side story franchises in Shin Megami Tensai, and once again, they use this as a test bed for a different system or a different approach to their design. So there you go. When you play, if you go from playing Shin Megami Tensei to Persona, the bare bones are going to be very similar, but they go in wildly different directions. So if you're a Persona fan, and you hear there's a new Persona game, you're going to be very excited. If you're a Shin Megami Tensei fan of the main branch, you may be you know less inclined, but you can still understand, okay, I have a good idea what this game's going to be about. And when one of those ideas don't work, well, the spin-off or the side story comes to an end. Uh, Digital yeah. Devil Saga had uh, two games, and then, you know, that world is done. I don't think they've ever yeah. done anything more with it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a really great idea. Like in like we were talking about earlier, like putting all your eggs in a basket or putting, your, you know, patting everything together. It's been also a great idea. You can like totally make a smaller game. And like we've talked about before, don't be working on your game forever for four to five, six years. You could probably get a couple others and like those little mechanics or things that you were doing, throw them out there, test them, you know, make them in a, in a, in a different smaller game. Spinoffs are real. That's really cool. I love, I'm like a sucker for spinoffs. I love mm -hmm. spinoffs because I know it's, I know it's just like, it's not the game. It's just a, a spinoff, right? And I can enjoy it separately and it's not like crushing you know the main my, franchise the main franchise right so it's definitely like a little bit safer and you can still like really experiment and do things mm -hmm. about it and again if it doesn't work it doesn't work it's not gonna sink hopefully not sink your studio <laughs> mm -hmm. look at uh like a dragon from yakuza yeah. again that it was basically hey let's just turn this into a jrpg and yep <laughs> Every time we mention like a dragon, <laughs> Josh has to pull out this copy of it. And yeah, it is a game that who the heck could have guessed that it was going to turn out so well? I mean, the developers literally made it as an April Fool's prank, and everyone was like, "Hey, that sounds really cool." It's like really, cool. really. Well, okay, let's let's do something with it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, like, it's one of my actually one of my favorite Yakuza games. It's so wild, like. It's mm -hmm. it and, and it's kind of the same and it's the same stuff but it's different and it's like oh yeah I love that game. that's why I pull it out every time just to <laughs> mm -hmm. and a uh, one point that I want to go back to before I forget when we were talking about like rebooting with sequels there's all and what as you were saying earlier about sometimes ruining or losing the magic of those original games that is another very big hurdle you have to worry yeah. about as a developer yeah because one hand if you make the sequel too different then people are going to be like well why did you try and you know lump that original game in on the other hand if you make it too similar then it's just like well what was the whole point of that um one the battle toads i think sequel is a really good example that a lot of people did not like the Battletoads sequel. It's still, I still have it. I'll be happy to play with everyone, but no one is taking me up on that offer. Play? I was like... <laughs> <laughs> and I was not a fan of the Tomb Raider reboots. Like, I could have my own major rant None about... Not really. I just felt <sighs> like it... It just, I think, removed some of the major points about that. And, you know, yeah. that is a rant I could have for a long time. Um, it was like a weird sanitation and a weird glorification. Like, it was it was <laughs> a little weird. Um, but, I, I, I mean, I, I thought overall, like, mechanics-wise and, like, uh, it was solid. I guess I would just say it was a solid game. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, probably... Uh, I mean, I really, I really liked how they went differently, you know, and they really tried to push something new with it while still trying to keep the same. Again, her her lack of not knowing if she wanted a tumor. Like, that was really weird for me. Like, she was, like, scared to kill someone at first, but then she was a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I'll, I will rant and rave about, you know, the um, back and forth of the story 
when yeah. or the uh, dissonance of the story. Yeah. I like the the first one. I I I'm a little bit a uh, nicer or kinder on because yeah. it was a brand new attempt. That's what I'm saying. That but, one was. I definitely got a pass on that one. But as they continued with it, I was like, oh. But yeah, yeah. And like with like the Battle Toads game, like. Uh, again, like reboots are a very big minefield to walk, yeah. and sometimes you just you can't, I think, change things too much when it comes to reboots. Like there's there are some things that they are core to the franchise, and again, like going back to as we said about with the core gameplay loop, there are certain things that are foundational that if you change them, then you don't have a game anymore, and. With the whole side story reboot and all that, I think that's what Kaya played uh, XCOM. Uh, what was it? Uh, the one that was the third person shooter. XCOM. The wait a minute. I think I have it in my library. I can double check this really fast. Uh, let's see. XCOM the Bureau. The Bureau. XCOM the Classified. That oh, wow. I I will stand by that. The idea of turning XCOM into a first-person shooter was great. Like I, when I heard the pitch for the original version of that XCOM game, I was enjoying that. Like I really wanted to play that game, but they ran into that classic problem of saying, "This is the new main franchise of XCOM. This is where XCOM's going to go," and it it, it led into you know open revolt. And again, the irony of that is that it led to so much interest in XCOM that they decided to make, or Firaxis wanted to get, got the license and make Enemy Unknown, which turned out to be one of the best examples or one of the best en entries in the franchise. And yes, we do need more XCOM, Vincent. I am looking forward to uh, Midnight Suns, the uh, kind of deck builder Marvel game. Yeah, I remember that too, Pony, from the uh, <laughs> Battletoads game. But again, it's that depiction or how you pitch things that is a major point about this. Um, uh, going back to Mario, people don't complain about Mario Party, Mario Kart, Mario Tennis, Mario Golf, Mario Soccer, Mario RPG, Mario Pinball. Am I... Mario Pinball is ruining the can. Mario Paint ruins the canon. <laughs> uh, Smash Brothers... Because they're labeled as side stories or as spinoffs. They're not considered, yet yeah, Mario Golf, they, they're not labeled as, you know, you know, we are never going to make another 3D Mario game ever again. They're just these little, they're diversions, and more importantly, they're test beds for new ideas. And this is something that we've said before, that a common misconception I think people have about Nintendo is that they never innovate. You know, they just keep working Ooh. on Mario. They keep working on Pikmin. But no, they are... They experiment with the designs. And they use their franchises as that foot in the door. You know, yeah, they're, like, really smart. They mm -hmm. are, like, so smart. People say they don't innovate. They are so smart about taking, like, their IP, using their IP as a test bed, and be like, check out this Wii remote. And then, like, they, just anything, they're really good at doing it. Here's the 3DS now, and, you know, they're, like, always innovating. And, and while it just, it might not be different, it's different the way they innovate, but they're always, like, on a cutting edge somehow, but more like in design and like uh, you know, thinking out of the box, really. Mm hmm. And again, it's that idea of using their franchises to their strengths. They know that is someone going to try this? Like, comp they're far, I think, more. I think new franchise at first. I think that is a like common or a fair criticism of Nintendo that it's yeah. rare to see a brand new franchise. We got ARMS, we got Splatoon, we have Pikmin, and I can't think of anything else. Uh... I, I really, yeah. 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 <laughs> and again, like, it's that challenge of knowing when is a, you know, concept strong enough to stand on its own, and when does it get, you know, applied to that kind of spin-off or that side story. And... Yeah, I I would love a like, co-op XCOM shooter, and 
Chris's idea about, you know, Mario with NFL Blitz. So we give, like, Mario his rage move. <laughs> wow, there you go. Uh, oh, I know. Mario's rage move. He grabs a guy, spins him around, and he throws him into the goal for a free there point. Go. There you go. I like to see Luigi's face when he does it. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, again, there's another really good idea of a spinoff, the Mario Luigi uh, Mario uh, plus Rabbids game. Who yes. the heck would have guessed that would have blown up? And I wow. love that game. I think it's a it's fantastic good. game. Yeah. It's, it's still just Mario. Mario. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Arms, I think, has that same issue. Like, It's a very interesting short burst kind of game. But again, it's hard sometimes to know you know, can we keep doing two, three, four, or five different games with it? No, I think you can only do one. I mean, um, yeah, I don't even know how well did ARMS do. Uh, Luigi's Mansion, they're up to three. I've only played the first one. I have not played Luigi's Mansion two or three yet. Yeah, I'm on one of them. I have one of them on 3DS, and I'm just, I just haven't played it much. Good game. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, Metroid. I mean, we've, people are still... People will always demand new Metroid, and uh, <laughs> and I know since Pony's in chat, we have to mention F Zero because F Zero is another one that people are dying to play. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I still want my Star Tropics third game. <laughs> there you go. And what sequel do I want? I'm trying to think of what sequel I would want. I don't know. I think I just want new stuff. I just <laughs> want new games. New ideas, new stuff. Um, I do love... I mean, see, and then I'm the type of person that I like. I can't even watch a movie twice. Like, if I've already seen the movie, I can't really watch it again. So um, mm-hmm. I, I always like seeing something new. Uh, or if it's in the same... If if it's, like, the same universe or the same IP, change it. Different, something new. But I can't really do the same thing over again. I think most people can't either uh, because of, like, the current timeline we live in now, so. Yeah. I mean, for me, like, a lot of movies I watch, I fast-forward through so many parts. I already know, okay, yeah. this is the part where they argue. Yeah. This is the uh, rom-com section. And, yep. You know, this is the big laser light show battle. <laughs> It's great for uh, time uh, maximizing or uh, min maxing. Like, you know, two hour movies, maybe like 30 minutes for me. <laughs> there you go. Like, put the triple speed, min max it. Yeah. And, like, yeah, Overwatch 2. Like, that's one of the games. I don't even. I think they're redoing characters and making them look strange. But, like, why would you even, like, do that again? Make that. It's just a live service game. There's, I don't really think there would be a purpose to do it, too. Other than you're trying to get a bunch of people to pay sixty dollars or something, I don't know. But it's just like some, you know, it's another game that doesn't really, I think, deserve a sequel. You know, yeah. it's like uh, a lot of shooters and a lot of like fighting games and things like that. I think uh, life service or just is is more compatible for those type of games. Yep. I mean, again, I don't think we will ever see a Fortnite two or a Fortnite three. Like, yeah. there's no, no need for it. No need for it. That would be that would be wildly like the worst idea ever to redo it. All you have to do is just keep tacking. And as someone who uses Unreal and knows the technology behind it, like they can just keep patching mm-hmm. it simply, and we keep they the engine keeps updating. They got the engine there. The engine's updating. So like the game behind the scenes is being updated. It's you know. So it's like why would you make another one? Mm-hmm. And to Chris's comment about EVO, yes, please. I would love a sequel to that one. And I'm going to test all the retro gamers watching this. Who here knows the game? I want a sequel to Soul Blazer, the uh, Square Enix or the Enix game that was kind of like from a Quintec. And I also want a new Chibi Robo as well, mm-hmm. if anyone remembers a, that one. I want a proper Act Razor. Act Razor 2. Mm-hmm. We've gotten several Ack Razors, just not a, a new good Ack Razor. <laughs> yeah. What's another one? I was just thinking about in the, my back of my mind. Uh, I want a new oh, clock. I want... Um, this was the one. This was actually the main one of my brain. Manhunt is one of my... I, I love that game, and it was so good, and the second one was so bad. Mm-hmm, yep. I enjoyed Manhunt 1. Yeah. 
It was a one man on one was amazing. Like mm-hmm. I, I secretly want to like get that IP and buy it. I don't know who has the IP, but mm-hmm. uh, let me know if you, anyone listening owns the IP. You can yeah <laughs> DM me. Yep, and I think too. Uh, I know. I think it was Game and Chat asked that question about you know the whole like fan revolt over three four three. Like oh yeah, that is such a again like it's that challenge. And that's actually another interesting point we didn't discuss yet. When we see sequels to major franchises that are done by different studios, like Call of Duty yeah. is a big one. Was it like Sledgehammer Games? Sledgehammer, and Tri- Tri- Treyarch, Triarch. Yeah. Yep. And, oh yeah, yes, uh, to Chris's comment, bring Conqueror's BFD, bring uh, Nuts and Bolts to the PC as bolts. well. Yeah. Again, we could probably just uh, dedicate the next hour just naming sequels names we want. want. Yeah. That's going to be the next one, sequels we want. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's that risk of when uh, when we see like different studios working on the same franchise, like that is definitely a triple A thing. Like we, that is not an indie dev thing. Indie developers don't pass it. You know, here's my game design. You work on this. Oh, I'll take this <laughs> one. There we go. There's our new uh, big put pitch for the indie dev. Just give, uh, just like trade this trade games and see how things work. <laughs> so many indie developers just had a heart attack right now. You get a uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. You get, you get um, um dusk. <laughs> dusk. Yeah, I'll get Stardew Valley. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but. Yeah, that challenge of, like, different studios working on the same franchise is such a very, (laughs) such a very big risk like that. Because then we have people go, oh, you know, this is from the good studio, and this is from, you know, the lesser one. Yeah, and and see, like, that that's, I touched on that at the beginning, like, um, for a sequel to, like, really, okay, like, for one, getting a game published and, and like, out the door is a miracle, it's magic. And, like, it requires a dedicated team that knows what they're doing, understands the core concept of the game, everything, right? And, like, when you pass it on to another team and it's another director and it's their interpretation, their interpretation is of your core goals and your core gameplay mechanics and everything. What the game actually stood for is totally up in the air and it's how they see fit. And so some, like, I think at the bare minimum, like, if you need, like, Call of Duty, of course, is an exception because they're going to make sure kids are going to play it. They're going to play the game. It's a shooter. But, like, we're talking about other games. You need to have a unified dev team that's behind it and together and that they understand, like, like the original game. So that way, when they're working on the second one, uh, everybody knows the tech. Everybody knows, the you know, the core gameplay loops and everything. And then it'll come out better. But when you're switching um getting a video call but when you're switching like teams and stuff like that it is definitely like a good recipe for like some bad stuff yep and a good example from what i games i like was king's bounty that king's bounty the legend the one that i played back in like mid 2000 early 2010 i love that game it's one of my favorites when they did king's bounty 2 a few like last year completely different team worked on that they went full yeah. 3d they you know threw a huge budget at it and just did not like it and as you said a new team coming in runs at risk of not understanding what did people enjoy out of that first game and not only that but different designers will have different aspects they want to focus on Yeah, and just like we were talking about, I I don't know, kind of like the vampire survivor thing, like, Mm -hmm. what people see is actually works in the game, right? And, like, all the clones, they're going to see something different. They're going to think, oh, well, maybe it was the art that really sold it, and it was actually the combat, or maybe it was, like, the fishing or the inventory management, but they don't see that, right? And the devs are going to have different interpretations of it, and and so, yeah, so that definitely causes uh, an issue, and, like, A lot of the times I know that that was like an issue, like another, you know, they lost directors or they lost certain people. So the sequel, um, you know, like Dark Souls 2 is one of the ones like Miyazaki wasn't on Dark Souls 2 and everybody knew it. Um, A a lot of people were still there. Right. And Miyazaki still had a little bit, but it wasn't like his main thing. So like a director changing directors, changing producers, big impact on that. Mm hmm. And it's that risk of, 
<laughs> oh, yeah, that would be uh, <laughs> gunfire tactics, yes. Final Fantasy Tactics has a spinoff as well, an ogre battle. Going from ogre battle to tactics ogre, that's another really great one. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. to Josh's point, that people will notice. And I think, again, like that's one of the things that we've seen more, I think, consumer intelligence when it comes to franchises and studios working on a game. And they'll know if something is different. They will try and do everything they can to figure out why. You know, there are some people who they will, like, data mine, or they'll, you know, they'll cross-reference the credits of game number one with game number two and say, oh, well, you know, this person didn't work on this one, these people aren't gone, so that's why the game failed. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And, and, and like, it really is... It's intra cool, you know what I mean? Like, um, you can have like you know people leave a team. It's like not every not every uh, person is 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 important, but like when you have like directors and producers or just like the visionaries of the team and people who understand it, uh, those are who you need on your team. And if you lose those valuable people or if you switch, uh, the, the product is definitely going to suffer, and the consumers are definitely going to know. Like the gamers are going to know, and they're going to tell. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, they're cross referencing everything. They're cross in their mind when they're playing it. They can tell. So, mm -hmm. and people again, they don't want to see. I think the three things they don't want to see is you know a franchise that's stuck in the mud. They want to see a franchise that is just completely, you know, going in every direction. They don't know where they want to go. They also want to make sure that their favorite studio is working on it. And it's why, again, that we see that kind of prestige of sequels that do it right. Why NetherRealm is now one of the uh, top-tier fighting game studios. And <laughs> when people aren't happy about their franchises, they're not going to come back. And like we've said, like that opens up the door to other games to do something. Um... Again, Diablo 3 failed so yep. hard at launch that Path of Exile blew up by proxy because of it. And good for grinding gear games, not so good for Blizzard. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and there's, there's always that opportunity uh, for another studio to pick up uh, on another one's failings, for sure. Wave Race Battle Royale. I love <laughs> it. Wave Race was Wave Race, uh, oh, is yes. one of, amazing game. I was actually watching a breakdown on, on how they did the water physics about a week or so ago. <laughs> yep, and um, I just had an example in the back of my head about when, oh, when the, the sequel is, like, too far removed, and I've lost it. But... Zelda game? Oh, yeah, thank you. I think Zelda, like, art styles. That's another yep. very interesting point. Cell shading. Yep. You know, how many people say, oh, this game looks horrible. How dare they do it? And then turn out to be, like, one of the best-selling Zelda the games. Best of all time, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. I mean, it looked amazing. Uh, Breath of the Wild, you know. Zelda in open world? How could this work? You know, this sounds horrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was so good. It was so good that uh, Elden Ring had to copy it. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still won't go back and play that one. Still have to go back and play Hitman. So many games. <laughs> Going back to logs. So many. Um, as a time check, we're about an hour and 20 in. I feel like we've touched on just about everything. Anything else uh, from you that we didn't hit on? Uh, I think we basically covered it. You know what I mean? I just, you know, if, 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 um, you know, and, and if a game is is having a sequel it needs to have plenty of meat right it got mm -hmm. to have plenty of meat on the bone and a lot of stuff for it to continue on and then uh i think optimally you need like if you're going to continue you need a good team you need a good dev team that sticks around and understands the core gameplay i think i've already repeated this for but i i guess that's pretty much it uh, that we've covered it all there. Uh, we do need to just have a podcast where we go over all the sequels that we want. We'll just do that one next. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just thought of one other quick point. When you're working on sequels, you should be very mindful. I think this was like we were saying earlier about the sequel should invalidate the original game or go in its own direction. You want your sequel, I think a good sequel, it should never be just multiplicative. That you know, we're just going to, as we said, you don't want each show to be bigger, bigger, and bigger, and bigger, because eventually you're just going to run out of steam. 
you yeah. should look for ways to do things differently. And even something as simple as just changing or adding a jump. Again, going from Super Mario Brothers to Super Mario Brothers 2, the 3 to World, are vastly, fundamentally different platforms. They're all platformers, they're all part of Mario's franchise. Still, you know, you can't say that you play Super Mario Brothers the same way as you do in World. So you want to look for ways that, you know, you can take a sequel in a different direction. And again, without compromising the core gameplay loop. And if you can do that, it gives your game, or it gives your franchise, I should say, a very wide berth. The, again, the horror, you know, universe example works really well. That, you know, uh, James Sunderland is different from Harry Mason, which is different from Heather, which is different from the guy in the fourth game, who I always forget his name. But Oh, James? No. No, James was two, unless they were both James. I'm I sure there was both James, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the James uh, Cinematic Universe, just like the Josh Cinematic <laughs> Universe. Yeah, and, like, that was one of my favorite things about the Silent Hill games, is, like, they were all the same, like, the same universe, but they were different. And, it, like, that, to me, that's a, an amazing example of it. It was, like, they not only, like, got better, like, with technology-wise mm -hmm. and with their coding and everything like that, but also new stories and new stuff and still keeping it all within the same vein. So, yeah, really good example of that. Uh, uh, Resident Evil. A fatal Frame as well. Fatal another Frame, good yeah. One. Yeah, I'd always get stuck with not, not enough film in, in Fatal Frame. Yep, I heard about that too, Pony. That I've been waiting for that to get into back into Katana Zero. Because that one, like, they left a huge cliffhanger when it came out. And yeah, like again, I think as a counter or as an example of what kind of caused trouble was when we saw Super Meat Boy go from being a platformer to an endless runner in their second game. And again, the Wait a second. Wait a second. There was a. I was. I was literally wondering if there was a sequel to Meat Boy. There was. Yeah, there was. Wow. Okay. I gotta and check that out. <laughs> a lot of people, including yours truly here, just did not like that one. And. Uh, it's called Super Meat Boy Forever. And again, wow. like, the developer, you know, they fought tooth and nail on Twitter with fans saying, oh, you know, you're just hating on this, or, you know, we have a better idea of what's going on. But the problem, again, is that if you make a sequel to a game and you remove a core gameplay loop of that original game, it's not the same game anymore. And... It's that, and again, I think this is that issue also when franchises aren't, there's so much of a delay between game yeah. one and game two. Uh, Super Meat Boy Forever, or Super Meat Boy, that was 2010. Super I'm Meat looking Boy. forever, and it's Super Meat Boy's back. This time around, Meat Boy is always running. Mm -hmm. Literally, it's an auto runner. And like, that was, the whole point was it was a super precise platformer. Mm -hmm. And you make it an auto runner. Wow. Wow. Oh. Mm -hmm. I did not. I guess that's why I didn't hear about it. Yeah. So that was a 12 year gap between Big the two gap. games. Wow. And I think oh, when it did you... just come out June, June 10th, 2020. Yeah, it was an Epic exclusive for a year and then it came out on Steam. Wow. And again, when you have such a long gap like that, you really do need to be mindful when you're bringing back a franchise like that. Yeah, that's big. And like, uh, oh, what's that um, adventure game that that's had a big... Um, uh, the Monkey Island one. Monkey Island one, right. And it's such a massive gap. It, it definitely have to be very, very careful in that mm -hmm. regard. Yeah. Show it to you, please. That was the pony. That was my least favorite mechanic, the hardened mechanic. I didn't oh. like that at all. I did <laughs> like... Uh, I liked a uh, moral show. I felt, and I, I guess that's another really good point to end on. Like when you're looking at franchises to grow or to look at, see what resonates with people, and if something worked really well, try to either expand on it or maybe use it as a basis for another entry. Because again, like we said, when you're working on a brand new IP. You never know what aspects people are going to love. Again, play testing and user feedback like that will only go so far. It's not. It's going to be a very different story on day one. Yeah. So if somebody really likes a certain element, 
see where you can go with it. And we've said before, there are lots, again, you know, our, you know, name our favorite games we want sequels to episode. There are a lot of indie games where I've said, you know, it's a great concept. I want to see where they can go with it. I want to see right. now that you've, you know, you've developed or you've created this, how do we enhance that? And yeah. it's that risk. And again, game development is so inherently risky like that. All risky, all risky. And the one point you brought up, though, about um, day one, right, is that, like, playtesting, betas, and paid, like, playtesters, you're going to get some stuff, but it's it's still, like, those are, like, okay, if people sign up for a beta or people want to play, they're already kind of interested, right? And mm -hmm. then, of course, you have your, your play that you're paying to playtest your game or to quality test your game or to QA you're not going to get the same feedback as when you have a paying customer playing your game and telling you about it, right? So that's just always something to keep in mind also. Yeah. Um, as one final example, kind of through that kind of went up and then went down, the Legend of Grimrock developers. Yeah! First man. game was really good. The Amazing second game. game, I I just fell out of love with it. I, I still have to do like a deep dive into that second one, figure out why I love the first one, and, and then the second, like one, the second one. Yeah. yeah? And then they went from that to making a, a tactical strategy game. And that one just, you know, it, it went over like a lead balloon. Yeah. Um, I remember two going over like a lead balloon, actually, yeah. a little bit. So, whew. As a very interesting point, Zen Studios has had a very, like, weird trajectory. They've gone, they've made, you know, the Pinball FX games. They've made... A dungeon crawler. They made. I think they did a, a tactical strategy game as well. They've also did some. They there's another game they're working on right now. They've gone like so many different directions, and I think. Uh, oh, I can't believe we didn't mention this. Clay, Clay has rarely. I don't think they've actually done a sequel except to uh, Shank or Shit, whatever that action based game was. Like they've. They're one of those studios that they've completely ignored sequels to their franchises. And I think it's to their better that they've experimented in some really interesting directions with their games. Uh, the mom secretary kid non-gamer test? Yep. Yeah. Shank, thank you. Shank, yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, when Chris was bringing up uh, the point about, you know, mom, mom, secretary, kid, non-gamers. I think I've mentioned this before, but like uh, who John Carmack said it, like the mom test or whatever. If you're if your game, it depends on the game. I mean, like, I don't mm -hmm. think your your mom's going to love Dark Souls like type games or something, but no. you never know. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Uh, you never know what you did to her when she was raising you. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, like, definitely, if they can, like, approach the game and see it without, like, and at least see something in it, that's a good, good help. So, like, always, like, enlist, always non-gamers are always a good way because they're not in the bubble. They're not in the thing. And I'm not saying depend on them, but it's always a good check. Uh, you know, definitely have, if you have some grandmas around or whatever, be like, hey, check out my, my uh, samurai pig game and tell me what you think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, to Chris's comment, you should check out or you should watch that play I did of Gloomwood, where it's Thief with Guns, and apparently that works really well for someone like me, or Thief with Exploding Barrels, you can set up everywhere and trap yes. enemies. Alright, but yeah, I think, other than just That's spending the next, like, five hours covering our favorite games we want sequels to, and yet, uh, I was going to bring up the plans for the Zombies uh, George Fan uh, GDC, but, you know, I brought that up so many times now. Yeah. And uh, to Will Wright, uh, let's not forget, again, that SimCity came out of his game, a raid from Bungling Bay or whatever. It was like this like, top-down like, helicopter shooter. And he found that it, the city-building part resonated more cool with part. him. And, you know, history was made because of that. You're you remember Simcopter, though, right, Josh? Oh, yes. Yeah. Never played it, but I've seen the footage Oh, you never played it? Oh, so good. It was so good. It was so neat when it came out. <laughs> I remember when they did the SimCity expansion where you could actually drive around your own city. Yeah. And how, I realized just how horrible I am at street design. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my God, who the hell designed this city with all these intersections? Oh, wait. 
That I was just, me. Yeah. I, I'm not a city planner. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. But I think with that, let's wrap things up so uh for everyone watching as always thank you for tuning in whether you're enjoying it live or recorded do the liking subscribing commenting all that great stuff excellent yes and uh my links are down below i will be streaming more now the kids my kiddos are finally going back in school so i have more <laughs> free time to stream so my stream will be more frequent uh check my twitter um and the twitch and a wish list samurai pig don't forget buy four of josh's books now at least One, 10 you have to do at, at least, least 10. if you 10. don't buy 10 in a row you don't get the uh bonus points you yeah, don't get prestige don't get, for that you know you don't, you don't prestige <laughs> <laughs> yep and we will be back next saturday around 5 p.m et for our start and if you do have a topic you'd like us to cover for a future episode again feel free to join the discord post a comment let us know yeah but that is going to do it so Everyone, have a great rest of your weekend and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, whereas I'm the art and science of games. Until next time, take care.